Hello, everyone, and welcome in to our New York Liberty Say It Loud LGBTQ Virtual Pride Week celebration. We are so excited to have some kick-ass panelists. Can I say, can I swear on this? We didn't just, we did not go over those ground rules. Okay, because I think kick-ass is the only word I can come up with to describe these women. I'd like to first welcome Kia Clark from the New York Liberty, the Chief Operating Officer, Lasia Clarendon, seven-year veteran of the WNBA, but also very importantly, the Vice President of the WNBA Players Association, and Amanda Zowie B, New York Liberty superstar in the making in her sixth year in the WNBA. Thank you ladies for joining me today. Cannot wait to have these discussions. So first and foremost, I wanted to talk a little bit about what we, what we wanted to get across today. You know, we're seeing a ton of these Zoom calls, a ton of these um, back and forth conversations. So number one, I don't want ours to be boring. I want ours to be super fun and interesting, okay? So that's my goal for us. Um, but more importantly, I want to hear from you on the importance of what you are doing right now in our organization. So in the WNBA, I think that we have been at the forefront since the very beginning of social issues. And I wanted to first talk with you, Kia, about why do you think that the WNBA and particularly the New York Liberty have leaned in to going into spaces that we're not always comfortable in society and saying, we are going to take a stand and have a voice in these spaces? Sure, Holly. You know, I think that just by virtue of who our women represent, um, there's so much intersection. There's so much to be learned and gleaned from what they do, um, just in terms of equality across the board. You can talk about gender equality, you can talk about racial equality, and you can talk about acceptance of LGBTQ plus um, people in general. And, you know, from the very start, and I can't say that I was around from the very start, but at least for the last 14 or 15 years, especially, we've just seen progress year over year and time over time and people getting more comfortable and people really, you know, being more accepting. But I always joke, you know, the WNBA was ahead of its time in, in, in a lot of these issues. So I'm happy and excited that we're reaping some of those benefits now and we're, we're getting some of that um, just um, attention. But, you know, women always lead any movement um, if you look back over time. So I'm proud of that about our league. I think, you know, there's still work to be done and, and we're continuing to do that. Um, specific to the Liberty, how could we not? You know, New York is a liberal city. There's every, you know, color, shape, form. It's the melting pot. So, you know, our fan base has represented that. We've been fortunate to have really eclectic and a wide ranging group of players over time. So, you know, that makes my job more fun. You know, the, the, the opportunity to, to showcase those differing attributes is, is really, you know, what I think is that, that piece that like, makes us leaders. It, it really does. Um, you know, I think back to when the WNBA started and I'm one of the lucky few people that have been working in the league since day one. I was I attended the very first game in Salt Lake City, Utah, where we had a franchise. And I don't think Amanda was even born then. May, Lasia may have been like a toddler, but I don't think the two of you were even born during this time. But um, I can remember this conversation that we would have. And it was like this, this major thing of like, well, how are we going to talk about a lot of the fans are lesbians? Like, you know, there would just be this undertone and this current of like, well, you know, we really want to lean in and have and do all this marketing, but they might be lesbians. And I just remember thinking back, like, how was that ever a conversation that we were having and how far we've come now to like the, the WNBA president or commissioner is leading the, the float in the pride parade in New York City. Like how far we've come, how, how do you think that is um, come about number one, Lasia? But number two, how does it make you feel that it's like, let's just talk about this. It doesn't have to be this like undertone of something's not right here. Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's tough because I have a lot of empathy for the leadership in the W over the years because it's women's basketball is just a microcosm for a larger society, right? So as the players who've been so upset and the fans rightfully so that the league hasn't always kind of done it right, you know, hasn't just owned who we are from the beginning, but we're fighting the same oppression that, you know, from in internally that they were fighting on the outward when they're trying to market us, when they're trying to market queer women, black women, all of the things. So I definitely had some mixed feelings about kind of the history of how we haven't always showed up for our players, but right. You can look back and just point to all the negative or look at how far we come, like you're saying, and some franchises have done it better than others over time. 
um, like a New York or Seattle, that's kind of always been one of those teams to own who they are. So I think some of it's just been the evolution of time and language. We know more than we did before, right? We have players who I think now, or even you look at the fast forward of like, you know, a Brittany Griner or myself or someone in the league, I can't speak exactly how Brittany identifies, but even now having like players who are non-binary and who are like really on the spectrum of gender in our league, like we've just come so far as a society. So when sports are a microcosm, of course, we've come so much further in the sports world. Um, there's still such a long way to go, but this league has just always been who we are. And, you know, when I was back at Indiana, <clears throat> excuse me, and we finally marketed to the LGBT community, right? You're talking about back in the 90s. I was born in 91, so I was alive, but I didn't really know what was going on in Salt Lake City at the time. And fast forward to what 2014 when the very first time we finally marketed to the lgbt community um i was telling amanda this on my our instagram live yesterday of like the first time we went to a pride parade when i was in indiana and the fans just some of them cried and we like we got off the float and hugged them and it was like they were just so grateful to be seen finally that the fever were at the pride parade because those fans had been showing up for the w for years and years and years so for us to start showing up and owning it for them means so much and these are the people who have been our diehards from day one you know our, our og lesbians our og fans who have supported us so i'm also really proud that we're just finally owning and they're getting to see like the work that they've done is now like a player like me can be out because they fought so hard you know for us in the past 100 percent um i i remember meeting some fans two women who had met as fans at a seattle storm game and they got married like we we are bringing women together we are bringing fans together in love through our love of basketball i love it so much um amanda before i get to you i wanted to share one quick story of how we have covered this issue because you know i work for espn and you know i I, I'm learning as I go because I haven't always known how to how to discuss these issues. And I can remember being doing a game in in LA and Brittany Griner was playing and she had just gotten engaged to Glory Johnson, who was also a player in the WNBA. And Glory was there at the game and she was sitting in the stands. And we kind of wanted to tell this story of, you know, Brittany just got engaged, how exciting this is for her. And she's engaged to another WNBA player, which is, you know, very unique for two pro athletes in the same sport to be engaged to each other. And um, I can remember kind of having these thoughts of like, well, how do I tell this story? And is this going to be, you know, are people going to think this is strange? And is this going to be awkward if I'm talking about, you know, she's marrying another WNBA player or whatever. This was, I don't know, maybe six or seven years ago. And in the end, I just said, Brittany Griner got engaged. Her fiance, Glory Johnson is here. They're in love. We showed the ring. We just, we just did it like a regular love story because it is a regular love story. And I just wonder like, how is it important for people to talk about and showcase you? And um, Amanda, you're muted, but I want to ask you of like, how do you want people to showcase women who are in this space? Um, as regular humans, you know, like we talk about anything and everything, um, we are not different, you know. Um, I love women, so like, I love women, but I post about gay men, you know, just showing support to another human being and having those conversations. And like you said, like, if you don't really know or you, you don't know how to go about it, then ask questions and then we just build a conversation from there. Because um, it's very important that we talk about it, not only for us who are living in it, but for the ones that come in after us, right? To normalize it as much as possible. And education is everything. Ed education is key. And, you know, being able to, if I would have watched that game and heard it as a young kid, I would be like, cool, like, I'm a married WNBA player too one day, you know? So, like, it's a beautiful thing. Like, love is beautiful and amazing in every kind of way. So, yeah. Um, Kia, I know that the the Liberty have been remarkable in this space. And part of it, you, you said, Amanda, is educating. And so it's like teaching little kids and, and people who have not been around the LGBTQ community. Hey, we're just basketball players. We're, we're, you know, just like you, we're, we grew up just like you little girls that wanted to, to play basketball or what have you. How have you guys tried to market and educate and make sure that you are leaders in that space? Yeah, I think Amanda said it best where, you know, it's just the humanization where people, we're all different people that come together. And our approach has really been celebratory, if you will. Um, you know, you're at a game, it's great. 
you know, phenomenal basketball is entertainment. How can we intertwine into their storytelling, um, telling the stories of players, telling the stories of people throughout the community, but more importantly, partnering with people within the community. And I think that was really the change agent for us. Um, I was with the team, you know, this is my 10th season. So our very first Pride Night was minimal, you know, and I'm not ashamed of it, but it was like, we called it Pride Night, played the game, had the giveaway, and then there was a post-game, you know, happy hour across the street at the bar and only the people who are sweet feed for that. So, you know, it was, it was a start. And, you know, I was the marketing manager at that point, so I was orchestrating that event. And I think as time grew and we wanted to be more authentic, we had to get out and become a part of the community and participate and meet the LGBTQ folks where they were. So then it became, can we table at Harlem Pride? How are we going to show up at Brooklyn Pride? Will we be in the parade? We were in the march in 2017. And I think that's been the most meaningful work. And then that's the moment where we get to lock arms with, you know, a nonprofit like the Alley Forney Center or Patrick Martin Institute and the Harvey Milk School where those are teachable moments. That's the moment where you say, you know, we're a professional basketball team, um, but these are, you know, activities or different activations that we want to do with you because we see value in this relationship. So I think that's really been the educational point for us. And those are moments where our fans, um, be it that they're part of the community or whether they're allies, can really become part of it. And the last thing I'll, I'll say is, you know, Laisha said she remembers you know, season ticket members crying in their first march. In our first march, I remember looking over and seeing a straight white male shedding tears because he had felt, you know, that as a people, as a league, as fans, that we had come so far. So, you know, those are some of the greatest moments and memories for me. Talk about being allies. And I think this is an important space. We're hearing this a lot in the Black Lives Matter matter movement that is happening right now in our country and this quest for social justice for black people. And I want to talk a little bit about allyship because um, I am not gay, but I have learned a lot about this, this community in this way. And I want to talk to Lasia a little bit about how I can be a better ally and how we can teach people like me to be better allies. So I grew up in a very conservative Mormon family, Mormon Salt Lake City, Utah, just very sheltered background, like so sheltered. You know, I just didn't know anything about the world. I didn't know any gay people. I didn't even really know what that was um, until I got to college and I would hear people whisper about someone being gay on the team or liking girls. Like I was just so uninformed with what that meant. And I look back now, I just performed a wedding ceremony for two of my female friends. And I, and I go from this very conservative little girl in Utah that didn't know anything to I'm now officiating gay weddings um, for my friends. And um, it took getting to know gay people for me to get to that space. Is like it took getting to know, having conversations with Brittany Griner. I tried to style Brittany Griner for the WNBA draft one year and I wanted to put her in a dress. And I was like, Brittany could be so pretty if she just dressed like this. And what I realized was that like Lasia, right? You're just face planning because what an idiot was I. I was imposing my vision of what a woman is on her. And she has to impose her vision of how she identifies on me. So walk me through the mistakes I made there and how we can be better as allies of understanding. I can't put my idea of femininity or femaleness on you. You have to teach me who you are. Yeah, that's a good face one. Plant. She <laughs> face planted. I knew I, I was scared to share it, but I knew I had to be honest, like I'm growing in this space, but help me be better. Yeah, I know I can face plant with you because we know each other. So I don't want to, you know, <laughs> particularly with like cancel culture and you don't want to one of the things is giving people the space to make mistakes and I think if a lot of people like you like are coming to the stage with like an open humble heart like no one's asking any ally or any of us to be perfect in this moment like and there's no such thing as like the woke olympics like just because I'm a queer black trans woman doesn't mean like I'm going to be the wokest and I'm never going to make a mistake or you know, not be aware of my privilege as an able-bodied person or say something wrong about like immigration. And so I think one that's there is not realizing, because I think cis white people can think like they just 
are, I mean, they are so far behind in some ways, but that there's so much to catch up and they're going to reach this destination. Like there is no destination for anybody. I think it's the first thing for people to realize, like we all should constantly be growing and adapting and learning or else we're missing the point. So even black people are learning and adapting in this moment. Um, so we're all just at different phases with it. And so I think to your point with Brittany, I was gonna say, was that the 2013 draft? Was that my draft class? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I had, I had like pulled up pictures of cute outfits to put her in and pantsuits and stuff, you know, and like that, it just teaches me that I didn't really know who Brittany was, even though I had known her and covered her for all this time in college. And yeah. I remember you showed up at the draft in a vest and a bow tie, you know, like how you present yourself is different um, than, than what I do as a woman. And those differences are beautiful. Like yeah. we need to live in and celebrate those differences. Absolutely. I remember that at the draft, it was at the final four, we showed up in like the, my team was like super gay and we had like bow ties and suits on. And then at the draft, I remember how liberating it felt to see like Brittany there too, because, and I think we have, um, Tony also was there wearing like a full pantsuit and so not being like kind of the only one, but I think it's giving people you know, offering the space and asking people is a, a lot of what we want. So like one example of something you can do as far as gender is like asking someone what their pronouns are, because it's assumed that like I would want she, but actually I've been talking about this more recently is like, I prefer, I, they're not preferred pronouns. They are my pronouns are that I would rather be called like they or them. And so that's one of the ways is like asking people or like asking Brittany, wait, how, what is your style that you'd want to wear? Um, and then being open when you do make mistakes. Cause right. You're saying you made the assumption that like, I want to dress people high just too. If I was going to put someone in clothes, like I would think like, Hey, yo, you like dope in this cute little bow tie. And so some of that is just, we project what we know, but being really open to learning and growing because it's not that you're not going to make mistakes, but it's being willing to be wrong, I think, and be willing to be confused in this moment because there's so much we're learning and language is changing constantly. So I think the biggest advice I could give to anybody in this moment is get comfortable with being uncomfortable. That's literally like the best place, something, you know, if you're on a panel or you see someone who's trans or you're seeing something about in this Black Lives Matter march that makes you uncomfortable, like take a moment and like, hmm, why is that? You know, ask yourself and reflect because when you're starting to see things out of the norm, it's not it's not weird that you're feeling uncomfortable, right? Like we're conditioned to think like Britney and women should wear these types of outfits. So when we break that mold, it's like, whoa, like I even do that when I see people, I have to undo all the thinking that I've learned of being fat phobic, transphobic, of thinking women should look a certain way. So sometimes when I see people in the middle too, I'm like, is that a girl or a boy? Oh God, I'm not supposed to ask that. Like, it doesn't matter. They can be who they are, but I even do it as a person who identifies in the middle. I have to constantly remind myself too that like that's, I, that's not my place. Like they identify, I identify, like they're, you know, in the middle. So just get comfortable with that. I think is the coolest thing and lean into that curiosity because that's all, that's a lot of that inner work we need to be doing these days. Like policies are going to happen. Laws donating money is really, really important work, but that internal work that we need to start doing is like when you do the internal work, then when you go to vote or do a policy, like you would, you want to fight for trans people because you've done the internal work to know that like trans people are normal people and they're great and they should exist. And it's not like trying to do the outside work without the internal work. So are you, I guess what I'm listening to now is you're giving me space to make mistakes. Like you're giving us space. Like if I have a question, it's okay to ask it. And I think that's what a lot of people. And I think also a lot of white people in this time are like, I don't want to say the wrong thing or I don't want to offend or it's, it's better to learn. Or, so what we're saying, I think as a group is it's better to learn, right? That we are okay having these conversations so we can learn. Yeah. So and I would say the thing you have to be careful is, is like, be intentional with your question. So don't ask something you could have Googled necessarily, right? Like the weight of, if you're constantly asking me like, Lasia, what does trans mean? I'm like, if God, Holly, if you don't Google that and quit wasting my time, you know, like there's certain things you can Google. So be curious, but when you do ask someone questions, be thoughtful and intentional about it because it is hard for the person of color, for the black person, for the trans person to constantly be asked questions that could have been more easily achieved by, you know, a quick search. And so there's a balance there. Do people. your own work, education. But, yeah. Yeah. Seek your own education. Don't ask all black people to educate you. But if you do have a question, like that is also okay. Yeah. I, I was reading something about that. That puts a burden on black. Like we shouldn't be going to our black friends right now and be like, tell me about this or educate me about this because it's, it's adding an additional 
burden to them, like do this work on your own. So the question I have for you then, Leisha, is when I'm covering you in the WNBA season, are you playing this year? First of all, how did we not lead with that topic? Are Hell you playing yeah, this I'm year? Playing. Okay. Yeah. So when I'm covering your games, pray, I'm praying that I get to go to the bubble, the safe site, um, and be there interviewing players. So when I say Leisha is playing really great, um, instead of using her or she, how, how are we supposed to announce you as a commentator now? So you can use they or them, or you can use my name again. So you could be like, okay. Leisha okay. just scored a three-point bucket. They're on fire this season, or they're on fire right now, or their three-point okay. percentage is up, you know, 90% from previous years or whatever. Or you can always just okay. insert, if you, if it's too, you can always use their pronouns. So they or them, which we have. We still need work. I know it's a plural. So some people get into like the semantics. That's of my grammatical part. I'm like, but then it's confusing because it's plural, but I'm going to yeah. get behind it because you told me that's how it goes. Yeah. Yes. That's something people argue and we're like, welcome to the limits of language, right? We haven't found a word. So when people argue that, Let's I'm like, expand. you're going to argue semantics over someone's lively life feeling, you know, seen and welcome. Um, or you can always just use her, someone's name again. So you can just say right. Leisha again instead of saying she or her or lay because you know me like that. So my nephew is transitioning right now and is becoming my niece. So we have a trans person in our family in little Salt Lake City, Utah. And it's been really interesting to watch her journey and how she's transformed. And we've had some of these hard conversations with, you know, like my almost 80 year old mom of like, you've got to get behind these pronouns so that she, Quinn, her new name, her new pronoun feels seen and heard. You're her grandma. You got to get this right. Um, so those are good conversations that we're having. Okay, Amanda Zalibi, you are in Sweden right now. Will you be able to get to the United States? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> New York Liberty, yes. here she comes. Yes, I'll be I there. love it. I love it. So tell me about, you know, you guys are in this this group. So much is going on right now with the Black Lives Matter after the murder of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor. Um, it's been really difficult and these language and the, and the race and the riots and the protests and so many peaceful protests. Um, you've been in Sweden for much of this and I've seen a lot of your posts on social media of this has been an issue there as well. What is your reality and how you're experiencing this kind of momentum behind race conversations in Sweden? Oh, um, well, until just recently, like people were not talking about race, racism out here. Um, it's very quiet down and, you know, uh, Sweden as a country, we're supposed to be in a box, you know, supposed to be too loud or too low. Everybody are the same, which is not the case. Um, and, you know, just trying, trying to use my platform out here. Um, I'm, the, I'm the only WNBA player from Sweden at the moment. And uh, I'm playing for the national team. So people know who I am when it comes to sports. And um, I actually called the TV and like one of the biggest TV stations I was like I want to be on TV and I want to talk about these issues because I represent all of that right um my father is from West Africa my brother is a tall biracial kid who looks black right like I always say like the police gonna shoot us because they see blackness first they're not thinking oh their mother is white you know so talking about that and just planting a seed, I guess, of being vulnerable out here and having those conversations. Because we, like I said, we don't talk about it. It's like, no, there's no racism out here, but my brother and I and my father, we are ex experiencing it, right? We go to the to the bank and they ask us to leave. And you know, uh, stopping my brother for no reason. And like my brother has stories for days uh, with the police officers and, I have them with um, in the education system in our schools where, you know, just because I'm black, I, I would I wasn't going to make it, and I wasn't even going to make it to high school and stuff like that. So just being very vocal, that's my thing. Um, I'm a Twitter person, so I tweet a lot. I'm trying to be on uh, Instagram as well, you know, reposting and stuff, but just using my platform. That was a lot, but I feel like I just I can talk about this all the time. You know, we. You posted something recently that I wanted to touch on because you talked in a very honest and vulnerable way about the anxiety mm. you're feeling and that you are having some depression and some anxiety. 
And I, I have to be honest, I think we all are having some anxiety because we don't know where we fit in all of this. You add the coronavirus, which I think is making us all very vulnerable. Uh, my sister is a psychologist and she said, humans have this much capability for trauma. Like you have a preset, you can handle trauma, you can handle trauma. Well, we, we were already under a great deal of trauma from the coronavirus and our lives being taken away for the last four months and then everything else. And so it's just created this microcosm of anxiety. So how are you dealing with it, number one? And how, how does it help you knowing that we are all um, suffering from this and we've just got to talk about yeah. it and, and support each other through it? Yeah, well, I have great humans around me. So, you know, having open conversations, especially with my mother, uh, being a white woman married, oh, she'd been together with my dad for 30 years, you know, an African man. And just being able to have that open conversation with her, like, yo, I'm so tired of white people killing black people. Like, I don't know how many days I woke, in, woke up and like, I need to talk about this. I'm angry at the world. Like, you know, and she talking and having that conversation with me is so healthy and so important. Um, I have learned how to journal for real actually write down my feelings and emotions and not just be on Twitter and write it there, but actually like letting myself feel everything, right? Um, the depression is real. Like it's hella real, right? And uh, it's hard to admit it because there's, I guess like this bad stigma about it, right? Like we're not supposed to be depressed. We gotta be strong all the time. We're not supposed to talk to a therapist and um, I'm doing just that. I should, if I'm depressed, I'm going to let you guys know because I know I'm not the only one. I'm talking to a therapist and I want everyone that has the opportunity to do that or, you know, just be able to talk to someone, a professional. And yeah, so that's kind of how I'm dealing with it. I'm, I'm talking a lot. I'm praying. God knows I, I'm talking to him 24-7. You're probably tired of me, but... <laughs> never, never. <laughs> you know, I just... But especially have like my father's always been big on history and um, the reality, right? Education of not just reading the history book that the white man from from Europe wrote, like mm -hmm. reading black authors and really listen to the people who lived through it. So having those conversations with him, um, and you know, like he's actually stuck in the Ivory Coast right now. Like he was supposed to be home three months ago. Um, they closed down the airport because France is trying to colonize the Ivory Coast still in 2020. So we are having that conversation too. Like slavery is still going on in Libya. Nobody talks about it. So that's kind of the conversations that we have in this household, which is really healthy. Uh, it is draining, but you need to, you need to get it out, you know, asking questions, um, and all of that. So, yeah. I like that. Okay. So Kia, I wanted to ask you, um, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine, Maria Taylor, and, and we were talking about mistakes that we've made covering people. And, you know, the ESPN did some stuff on the NBA or in the NFL draft that kind of got some pushback. And one of the comments she made was, you know, if they had more black people in the room and they had more executives who were black, if, if we had had more black voices in the room, someone could have said, I don't think we should put that up there. I don't think we should cover this kid that way. And it's like more black voices. So I'd love to hear, how did you get your job and what are you doing to hire people who look like you and empower those people in your organization? Yeah, I'll start by saying I, I don't think any one of us has made a single comment yet um, in this, you know, the first 30 minutes that didn't involve the intersection between being a woman and being a Black woman or a woman of color. So it's plain to see that inclusivity and having diverse voices in the room is of the utmost importance. Um, I actually got my job um, really by coming up through the WNBA and the league. Um, starting pretty junior. Um, I spent five years at um, the league office and then came to the Liberty um, as a marketing manager. And I was really, you know, closely intertwined with senior management then. And they made some really courageous decisions in terms of platforms and what we would really dip our toe in. And I was proud to learn a ton during that time. Um, but I think when I ultimately got into the role as the business lead, it was of the most important thing on the list was to make sure that there were other people in the room who could bring 
different life experience, different worldview. So, you know, there was a point even when most of the Liberty dedicated staff was women. And we were like, I looked at it and said, well, we actually need some guys on the staff because, you know, we can't be completely homogenous. Um, but I will say it has been a deliberate, um, a deliberate um, uh, experience for me to, to pick and choose the right people who have the right skill set but also to pick up some minority women, um, you know, three fourths of the senior leadership for the Liberty are women of color. I'm proud of that because who we are representing and the values and thought process and what we're trying to accomplish is just, you know, you're halfway through the battle because, you know, you speak that language already. All the while not claiming to know everything. You know, I've lived my entire life, I'm black. I lived my entire life as a woman um, my mother is gay, so I'm an ally, but I still have something to learn in every single one of those buckets. And I am super, super proud that I get to align with players like, like Zowie and Lasia. They make it, it ain't my job easier, you know, because it's like, we're all vibing. We're all tossing out ideas. We want to approach the heavy conversations um, and all the while we want it to, you know, really represent that they're the, the best basketball players in the world. So those two things that I'm balancing um, make this a really, really fun job for me. Um, but I feel like I am fulfilling to a certain extent a personal passion, if you will, because, you know, of who I represent. I love it. You know, the, the WNBA is 80% Black women. And so I feel like the, the most we can do to elevate and expand and, and shout from the rooftops, the issues that Black women are facing I think we owe that to the women who we are fans of and who we are watching play basketball because it's more than just sports. And so, Leja, I wanted to talk to you about your work on the WNBA Players Association. You know, the collective bargaining agreement was just agreed to. And in there for the first time ever was some language that I think is going to impact you moving forward in life because are you about to become a parent? I am in December. So we announced yesterday that my wife and I are pregnant. She's carrying. So I will be playing this um, upcoming season. So no time off for me. Shout out to having another womb because I do not want to take a break. <laughs> I have to get back <laughs> to the state. <laughs> so one of the important things and one of the important rights you fought for in the Players Association was maternity care and mm -hmm. better health care. I think we have read on the news all through this coronavirus pandemic that black women have some of the poorest health care in this country, that that is one area that racism is physically impacting people of color. Um, so how, how did that work come about of you fighting for better health care and rights, particularly maternity rights for women of the WNBA? Yeah, we just, we have so many moms in our league. I don't know the total number. It's definitely over 10, I, think, I believe uh, maybe 11, 13 even. Um, and so just thinking about, this was before I was even thinking about it necessarily directly to my story of eventually being a mother, um, was just that we face unique challenges as women because obviously we can have children and we have people in our league with kids. So in that way, we're always thinking like, well, what does childcare look like for those moms? Like we know these people. I played with Bria Holmes. Um, you know, I've played with Skylar people. There's like not anyone in this league probably that hasn't played Zowie. You had, you were teammates with Bria Hartley. And so we all mm. see what it's like for them day to day showing up as mothers trying to do their job um, when they're showing up to the gym and like, what does breastfeeding look like? What does traveling on the road look like? What does child care is expensive and you have to go to the gym and practice for three or four hours. And so it was kind of a no brainer in that sense, when we're thinking about representing the whole league and it was unique to them because we we've seen our teammates. It's like being an out, like almost like we're allies to the moms where we're like, holy shit, that's a hard job to do. How can we support you? And so the thing, um, it was kind of a no brainer in that way. And then we had a lot of calls too, with just like, wanting to get the moms on the phone because there was things that I didn't think about um, as not a mother right now, that it was like, we need to hear from them themselves, like ask the people who are being directly impacted what they need. So we were constantly sending out, you know, surveys and getting on the phone and like, Lori, what does it look like for twins? Like, do you get two childcare stipends? Like, it's just, there's so many layers there. Um, and the things we heard from them firsthand were things we never would have thought of. Like, where do I breastfeed? And then is there somewhere for me to store it? Like you're at the gym and you're like, oh God, I don't know. You just expected to just chill and breastfeed in the locker room or pump in the locker room. And some players have had to pump at halftime. And so it's just a really unique challenge that we wanted to take head on and take a lot of pride in that. Like we are working mothers and we need to 
find ways to support them. And so one of the things I loved was like the childcare stipend for players, because I've seen Bria Holmes come, we're playing in Mohegan Sun and it's like either that care center is open and you've got to pay for a full day of childcare just for, you know, three hours of practice. So that childcare stipend now, like an opportunity to pay for someone to come to practice with you. Um, and we just didn't want people to be mommy tax. Like, I think it was time to put our money where our mouth was and the league really acknowledged that and Kathy did of like we can't be the most progressive league without the most progressive policies and so I think that's where the governors the owners which we're not calling them owners anymore the governors and Kathy really stepped up to the plate um, and just met us right there it was kind of a no-brainer and then changing the policy from uh, what 50% maternity leave to 100% that you know, you shouldn't get mommy tax for having to take a year off because you wanted to have a child. So still reaching that hundred percent, that's something just a lot of pride in knowing someone can have a child and not have to worry about how are they going to earn and get back into shape. That's amazing. That is so amazing. You know, I always think back to Candace Parker. She was one of the first to be playing and have a baby. And we were at the Olympics in 2012 in London. And I just went as a fan and there was Candace trying to be an Olympian at the highest level um, I, I will say in that gold medal game, she was the best player in the world in that moment. Uh, I will always say that. And she was toting around three-year-old Layla with her everywhere. And I was like, this is hard. She's trying to be an Olympian in London right now. And she's also a mom of a three-year-old. This is hard. So I just so much respect for the women in this league and how they've been able to hold all of that down. Okay. I wanted to ask one other question. Um, it's kind of on a different vein, but I wanted to get your opinions on this because before our call, Lasia, you were talking a little bit about listen to us at this time. So a lot of people in, in our society right now, we're tweeting, we're posting, we're sharing all these things about the Black Lives Matter movement, what it's like to be Black in this country, um, voting, how, how important voting is and getting out and supporting the change of policy and local law. And the thing you said that I thought was fascinating is listen to us. We, we have been living this life. So what do we need to be listening to you about? Like, how can we um, let, let your voice be the guiding voice in this time in history? Yeah. So I think there's just this rallying cry, like you're talking about that now everyone is, I'd say like awakening to the amazing magicness that black women are like, hello, we've been here. We've been shining this whole time. But people are finally picking that up of like, oh, wow, like Black Lives Matter was started by Alicia Garza and these phenomenal women who I think Kia said have always led the movements who've always led in history, but haven't always gotten the credit for it. And so in that way, it's like I want people to connect the dots that like the W is are those Black women who've been doing this work the whole time and haven't, you know, always gotten credit when we were with Colin Kaepernick, one of the first leagues to protest along with him but didn't get the attention until we were fined and still aren't brought up in a lot of mainstream conversations it's like oh did the other NFL players do it did MLB you know Megan Rapino did it which is great but it's still like hello the WNBA was right there and so I just want people to connect those dots that like we are those black women you should be following like it's not just saying you're following it as a part of the movement and then the W comes back and you don't support us like do you really support black women and social justice if you're not supporting the WNB? WNBA, which is 90, 80% uh, black women, and obviously a whole league full of women. And so I say that to every person from like the white person who's now becoming aware, like, wow, I need to follow black women to like the NBA guys who are saying that and always are centered in the movement too, is like the black men who stand up for the, the movement, which is great. But like, you also need to stand like, you know what I mean? When we get back, like, I, I'm like ready for this energy that everyone is talking about to be like well you better be the first person supporting the WNBA if that's what you've been tweeting about and rally crying about because we are those women and so we've done so much phenomenal work um, across different teams and different players individual platforms everything from what Maya Moore did you know two years ago and is really close to getting Jonathan Irons out of prison um, for a wrongful conviction to you know, the work Brianna Stewart's talked about with being a sexual assault survivor. It's just across the board to Amanda Zowie B talking about her Black European experience. Um, and there's so many organizations that we've all talked about. Some people have started some, some people are just plugged in to those organizations on the ground. And so in that way, it's like, listen with a close ear to what we're doing as individuals and as an entire league, because we will have some social justice initiatives that we come out with when we play this summer. Yeah, I like what you pointed out though, is the W has been one of the forefronts in this, in this area because, so Colin Kaepernick knelt and I, like many Americans, didn't really understand what it was about at that time. You know, he, he very 
honestly said this is about police brutality until every American can be treated the same. That that's what he was trying to draw attention to. And then the mainstream media and everybody kind of spin it into this thing about patriotism and the flag and the military. And I, it was confusing for me. And I, I remember feeling like, well, my dad always taught me to stand. I do think it's disrespectful to the flag. And then the Indiana fever knelt for the national anthem. And because of who the women were on that team and the respect I have for them, um, Tamika Catchings is someone that I respect more than almost anyone in life. And that Tamika Catchings knelt, that got my attention. And, I, and that was the moment that I started to dig in. And like you said, I'm researching and finding out stuff. And um, I, I think it was Natalie, was it Natalie Achanwa that did a wonderful op-ed piece about the police and that you can't, you, you, this doesn't mean you're against the police if you're also for black lives. And you, you women have been teaching us from day one right. of all of this, yeah. all of this. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's such a great example. I think too, we've just been doing the work and it hasn't always gotten highlighted in a big mainstream way. We have had local reporters, we've had some people pick it up, but it hasn't gotten, I think the national recognition it should get just like our league doesn't always get that like big, big, big national, like we should be the front page of every newspaper kind of LeBron dunked, like what that would look like if our version of Tamika Catchings had kneeled on the NBA side, how much you would have seen that on Sports Center, 17 different angles and all of it. And so it's just wanting to still get that, like create, still creating that, knowing we have a long way to go with making sure we're covering that and talking about it and not just being invisible because that's what we've seen. I mean, you know, we really want to support like the Say Her Name campaign this season because that's the campaign that's talking about saying the names of black victims of police brutality police brutality. Yes, Brianna Taylor's getting ignored in all this. That's what's really making me angry right now is that, you know, e everything has turned to George Floyd as it should, but Brianna Taylor was shot in her own bed. And it's another example of how black women are being minimalized in this, in this fight. And so tell us about the say her name, like how can we promote and elevate that in the W this season? So right now we're trying to get them on their shooting shirt. So that'll be one thing that we can eventually then like tell the stories behind it. So we haven't finalized whether it's, you know, every team picking a victim, obviously with the family's blessings and being able to like kind of tell that story. If each team dedicates their season to a certain player or each individual player wants to pick a person, because there's definitely 144, unfortunately, women that this has happened to and even specifically black trans women. And so we're looking at the logistics of how to pick them and how to highlight and tell the stories behind it. And then, you know, what's the specific initiative too that you can post and tell people about on game day. So it's like justice for Brown and Taylor, like fill out this form, email this person. We're still putting pressure on, you know, the Kentucky legislators to go after her victims. And so trying to make it like the activism side and raising awareness. And then the, like, how do you push to get the policy, the law side of it and make them take action? Because unfortunately, we've seen you have to literally berate and raise public attention to put the pressure on a lot of these lawmakers and officials to actually seek justice or else like there's still names I'm walking in my neighborhood and people have been putting vigils and different things. And I saw like four names yesterday. I was just like, I don't even know who these people are. Like I, I was like getting choked up of like, I've never even heard that name. Like I don't, there is, I like, don't want to use the word celebrating, but we're not honoring people um, in, in the same way. And a lot of that is black women. And I think what you said, trans women have been, and they are being killed in high numbers right now. And that's a group that needs protection perhaps more than anybody right now is yeah. black trans women. Um, okay, Amanda, what are you doing in your community from an activism standpoint? Like you're going to be back with the W playing and in that bubble and you can do stuff, but at home in Sweden, where you are now, what are some of the initiatives you're trying to be, make an impact there locally? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I am actually working with this company that is called Luca Heroes. And um, it's really focusing on basketball and just bringing basketball up in the community. And um, my role is that I'm focusing on this one group, particular group um, of young women or young girls uh, who are black or immigrants with immigrant background and just making sure that they are safe and having a, a safe place where they can play basketball and just be kids, you know, uh, and not feeling the pressure from the outside world that they are, you know, 
they th- that they look different, you know, and just being basically just a friend who can, you know, help and teach them and be there for them. Um, so that is my focus in Sweden. Then just keep on like talking about everything that is going on, you know, trying to talk to as many newspapers or radio stations, um, calling people out, you know, um, making sure that people are being held accountable for what they're doing and saying. Um, yeah, but then we also doing something very exciting with uh, the Liberty in the bubble. And we are going to have a book club. Uh, yeah, where we just educate uh, young black women um, and reading black books uh, by authors and black stories. And, you know, cause education is key and, you know, just building on that. Um, and then we're gonna have Zoom meetings, so why not? And just sit and chat and have an open space. We can talk about our feelings and thoughts about what we read and what we learned. Such a good idea because your fans are gonna be at home watching from Brooklyn and from all over New York, but you wanna keep the fans engaged. So Kia, how are you keeping the fans connected to the team even though they'll be at this safe site? Yeah, you know, some of the examples Zowie just mentioned, really we've all, I think, become experts on Zoom and streaming and YouTube and IG Live. So um, particularly for our membership, our base, our core fans who have followed us everywhere we've been over these years, um, you know, around New York. And ultimately we're, we're looking forward to playing at Barclays this summer. Um, we want to stay connected. So we want to provide, um, you know, chalk talks. We've got an exciting new, entirely new coaching staff. Um, many of the faces on our team are new um, and they've heard from them, you know, in a lot of regard, but, you know, from Sabrina to the five other rookies on our team and then these incredible voices that we're with today, um, we, we're, we're trying to break that up and really concentrate different themes throughout. Um, additionally, we plan to, you know, execute a lot of the theme weeks or theme nights that we would have done in arena. Um, it started with draft when we had our virtual draft. Um, it continued with Juneteenth on last Friday, which was, you know, sort of a, a tentacle out of our Unity platform that will continue once we're at the single site. And um, then weeks like this week and moments like today, um, you know, the more that we can provide that education, the more that we could extend, you know, that sense of community amongst fans or prospective fans. Um, we want to provide those opportunities, certainly. Um, but I think, you know, I can't say enough that activism absolutely has a place in sport. Um, so I listen to them. <laughs> you know, I, I keep it simple. We listen to them. And as much as we can amplify what their thoughts are, what their ideas are, what they are saying, and bring that to, you know, people in strike up meaningful relationships with with organizations both corporate and nonprofit. I think we're doing the work for the Brooklyn and the Manhattan communities. Um, you know, we're still kind of fresh to Brooklyn. So as soon as you know we're in phase three or four or whatever the phase is that you know we could be outside and actually you know in community with folks we 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 definitely want to do that until the players get home, until they're fully immersed. And um, once we're through the 2020, 2020 season. Okay, so Alicia, who is your fantastic PR person, I wanna give her a shout out because she is kick-ass, like seriously kick-ass. Um, she sent me this Brooklyn hoodie and it is so great. It's got like the black and green, you know, the Statue of Liberty green, and it is so cool. So where can people get that? Because I've gotten so many people like, where did you get that? We got to get that sweat, that hoodie. We got to have that. We got to have that. Yes. So that signature hoodie, uh, which Laisha actually delivered to Sabrina uh, the day after draft as well, um, is available on our website. If you go to nyliberty.com, um, click shop. Um, it's available for sale there. there. And, you know, really quick extension story on that. The company who produced it, um, a new licensee for the New York Liberty, that is a female owned, black owned, Brooklyn based company um, curated. And we were deliberate in partnering with folks like that. So we're happy to support um, that company and you know, continue to really be you know, practicing what we preach. So we're excited about that design for sure. So definitely go get the sweatshirt. Okay, give me, literally give me 12 seconds. Laysia, you ask one question to somebody. I'll be right back. I got to show them the sweatshirt. It's so cute. Go, Laysia, <laughs> t- 20 seconds. I'll be right there. Got it. 
I was gonna say that's why the sweatshirt's so comfortable too, because that thing is fire. Have you got one, Amanda? Uh, I think it's on its way. Like, I'm having like issues with seconds. the mailman's right now. Yeah, New York Liberty. It's so How dope. What is this? It is so dope. And the thing I love, like, look at the yeah the tie, the hoodie tie, and then it's got like the Liberty on the on here. I'm telling you what, I, people have been raving about this. And now that I know it was from a black owned, um, women owned company, man, I'm gonna be your best spokesperson for that. Okay, <laughs> what question did I miss? We were talking about the sweatshirt. <laughs> <laughs> it's so cute. I'm sorry, but I had to show it. It's so damn cute. Okay, um, before we go, I know we're supposed to get off at the top of the hour. We got nine minutes left. So um, I have two recommendations for the book club. I have discovered this author, Ibram Zendi, um, I read his book about two years ago called Stamped from the Beginning, and it is a book about the history of racism in Europe and Roman times, like back to Caesar Augustus. And, um, you know, we always look back to the Romans and think they were so woke and so smart. They were racist. So this book was really good, Stamped from the Beginning, but he has a new book out called How to Be an Anti-Racist. And mm -hmm. it is changing my mm -hmm. life. It is, I'm telling you what, it is so good. So those are my two that that author would be really good. Maybe you guys could get him on with the Zoom call with your fans or something because he is awesome. Amazing. Thanks for the suggestion. Yeah, he has a cute little book too right now called how, um, The Anti-Racist Baby. So I'm going to get that book. For oh, the, yeah, we the have new that baby. So Did cute. you get it? So that's yes. the author. I feel like now I have to run and grab it and show you guys too. <laughs> okay, yeah, so that's the author and he's really good. I've, I've enjoyed him. All right. What are our goals for the season from a um, from pride, from elevating black um lesbian, queer, trans, everybody, elevating those women, elevating our black women. You know, like I, I used to be like, I don't want to put labels on people or put people in a box. Um, but I'm also thinking that we need to see the differences in each other. So these aren't labels. These are celebrations of what is different amongst us. So do you guys mind just going around? Kia, we'll start with you. Then Amanda, then Leisha will end with you on nine minutes of what our goals for this season are to be better in this space. Yeah, I think, you know, my challenge is going to be having that connective tissue and maintaining, you know, who we are and those values of the franchise, even in the single site. And it's going to take a lot of effort. It's going to take a lot of technology. Um, but, you know, the willingness, I cannot say enough of the players on this team, the coaching staff on this team, the general manager. I've, you know, volunteered for every single time my team says, well, you're going to be on the panel. I'm happy to do it. And I think we owe that to our fans. Um, I think um, we're having really good conversations right now with some corporate partners who have, you know, want to be involved with the Liberty in this space, in this time and space specifically. So I think for me, my goal is as much as we can maintain that, that connectivity, even in a challenging remote um, season, um, we will have accomplished something if, if people show up in mass um, in 2021 when we're back at Barclays. So that's, that's my whole goal. I love it. Amanda? Yeah, um, I think just like keep on having the hard conversations. Uh, Leja said it earlier, um, where if you feel uncomfortable, then we should be in that space to educate ourselves and keep on building on that. And, you know, this is a great way of connecting with people. You know, we're going to be in a bubble. So being in that bubble and connecting and having those vulnerable com conversations, not only with our supporters and fans, but like within the team as well. I think that we have had great conversations. You know, I cried on one of them and I, it, I just felt like it was home. Like I was talking to family and I feel like if we can build that relationship and, you know, welcome everyone into it, everyone go are going to learn more and understand better. So yeah. Love that. I'm like competitive. I'm like, my goal is to win first in the bubble. <laughs> <laughs> good. Go. That's a good one. <laughs> I'm like, people are sleeping on us because we're young. We're going to be like young and cover quickly and like running fast. There we go. Uh, but my goal as far as is elevating, there's a level of raising awareness that needs to happen. So the like people don't even know the black trans women's names who've been murdered because it's not getting the coverage or saying Brown and Taylor's name over and over and over. And so raising awareness about these issues 
through our platform, which is what we have such a great opportunity to do by coming back and playing because we have the ESPN, maybe the CBS, the different networks and the media who's covering us in a different way than when we're kind of home and all spread out. So that power of the 144 players together, I think is really something that has never happened and there's such an opportunity. And so one, I'm excited to connect with my teammates because I'm on a new team, I'm a veteran, but I've never got to hang out with them in person. So I'm like, oh my God, see everyone in the bubble, um, just connect and build chemistry and be able to mentor the young ones because we have such, so many young players on this team. Um, and I think there's a unique opportunity to model for them you know, what it can look like that you can do both. Like you can do basketball and activism. Actually, basketball can be the jump off platform for your activism. And so we're in this like opposite time of the shut up and dribble where it's like people expect you to say something now. And so making sure, you know, players feel comfortable and that they don't always have to be the first one to talk, but they can, you know, get involved in whatever lane they want to be. You don't always have to have the one with the mic in your face to make an impact. And so showing them and modeling them that for them. And then the opportunity to connect with, the other teams because it's so hard to organize and like even just doing it through the CBA and trying to get this last proposal through to play it's like getting people on zoom having phone calls with 12 different cities 12 different players per team the opportunity that I see for us to have these global national conversations with each other in a way that you can have round tables and podcasts and connect with like um, you know I want to do one around gender with all the people who are like in between like myself and Zowie and Brittany and Courtney Williams and like have a gender conversation with them. So I think there's such an opportunity that it's a big goal of mine to connect around the league in a way that we've never really had the opportunity to do or be in the same room because what all-star happens and there's, you know, 24 of us together, but now we have a really cool, you know, chance with everybody around. And lastly, I just want to add, I really want the platform to be something where people get educated out of this. And so it's, for example, if we end up wearing shirts that say different sayings on them, I want people to understand the impact behind it. Like if we're talking about defunding the police, understanding what that means and the history behind the police and why we need to defund them because we need to pour resources into other things. And so always making sure we're giving people that education behind the why, behind why we're doing something. Because like you talked about when the flag happened with Colin, it's so easy and quick for people to just jump to the like, well, what do we do without police or it's disrespecting the flag or this is wrong but when you stop and explain to someone and they can listen and hear typically everyone's rational not our president but like most people are rational and can understand that like this is a logical thing that is going to impact people for positive awesome okay well my goal to you ladies is i will do my best as holly Rowe, a human to um, be the best ally I can be in all of these spaces. And I hope you would feel comfortable if you have any ideas you have or any ways that I can support you, let me know. I'm, I'm here to be a, an ally in that place. Um, but also because I work for a powerful media company and, I, and we're already having, like I, I couldn't sleep last night just because everything's going on. I'm so anxious. So I sent an email to, to people like, I want to know what our social justice platform is going to look like around the WMB season. Like we want to have shows and like you're saying podcast, like help, we want to help facilitate all of these discussions and, and throw that power of, you know, that ESPN brand behind some of this social awareness. So I'm hoping that we can do that internally. I don't know that, you know, that's conversations I'm having with my bosses, but that is a hope that I have for our company that we are all in on this and, and raising and elevating, um, the black girl magic. I once told the China Robbins that I hate the black girl magic phrase because I feel left out. I want to be in the black girl magic phase. And she's like, Holly, you got to give us something. We got to have something that's our own. So I will just be the best black girl magic ally ever. Okay. <laughs> I just feel jealous because you guys are so magical. That's all. You're so beautiful. So thank you so much. We have loved having this conversation. I hope you guys have been, um, empowered to say what you want and feel like you have said everything that you want to say. And I know that I'm a better person for listening to you beautiful women today. So thank you so much. Thank you, Holly. Go thank on, you. buy the t-shirt, buy the hoodie, um, pay attention, watch the games, get involved because the W, we are leaders in this space. Our W family, I will put up against any family in the world. And I mean that with my whole heart. So get involved. The W family is here for everybody. And we thank you so much for joining us today.